This program was paid for by Water of Life Church. From Water of Life Ministries in Plano, Texas, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is speaking through his servants to the world. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. Let us join Doyle Davidson and others of Water of Life, sowing the Word of God in spirit and in truth. Hello, I'm Doyle Davidson, servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, ministering vocally to the body of Christ in Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, sent by God to your house to declare unto you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, tell us what the gospel is. Now that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me as he's anointed me, preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the broken heart, preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty, them that are bruised. The word is lightly, even in your heart, in your mouth, is a word of faith, which I preach, that if you will confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, believe, and you are that God and raised him from the dead. You shall be saved with the heart, man believing unto righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Everyone that believes to the Jew verse and also to the Greek, there is the righteousness of God revealed. Faith to faith, the just shall live by his faith. Thank God. Want to welcome everyone to this broadcast, receiving on live stream, broken Apple TV, YouTube, and other devices. To my left, Kathy Davids, my co host. Good morning. Good morning. And how are you? I'm doing well. We uh, are going to be talking today about what the Mayflower, right? Perhaps Rhode Island founders, mm-hmm. something, our background, our ancestors. But you know, before we talk, I had a mother, Alba, Sarah. Miller, that loved to play the piano and sing hymns. She'd sing them by the hour. Someone once said, might have been you. It was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she sung her way to heaven. Frankly, I love my mother and dad. Had great respect for both of them. <coughs> and they had expectations out of me that I wasn't fond of. <laughs> dad would 
say, you're going to preach the gospel. Goodness. But Mother would sing just about any song you'd set before. Mother, the old record cross. It was always sad to me. But you know what? It wasn't intended to be sad. Amen. Amen. One day, God brought a woman to my ministry, 1985. And I don't know if she ever thought she'd be ministering some solos. Never. <laughs> hey Amen. You heard her. But about three or four years ago, 13 is when I first really kind of hurt her, I think. But my goodness, I thought, Lord, you've done exceedingly abundantly above all that I could think or ask. Not that I wasn't used to some good solos, but not that could sing songs that my mother used to say. And though this woman is not my mother, Terry Brown, the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old
I think they used to sing that when you were a little girl, right? That's right. My, my grandmother had a piano in her house, and she had an old hymnal. And my parents and my grandparents would go into the kitchen, and I would sit in the living room. There was a big red chair. And I would sit in the chair sideways because the chair was too big for me. And I would take the hymnal, and the first song I would always sing was the old record cross. And it was funny. You could hear my parents talk, and I would just sing. Frankly, I was singing to the Father. He liked to hear me sing. And, and my parents and my grandparents, every once in a while I could hear them get quiet. And I never realized until later they were listening. But they left me alone in the living room with God. When that happened, oh, dozens of times. You know, you've told me the last seven, eight years something that amazed me. You had the heart to believe that Jehovah liked to hear you sing. And that was something that he ministered to my heart. That's why you're preaching. Didn't know anything else as a child. Nobody told me that wasn't true. Right. Yeah. That's why you're preaching the gospel to my left. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm not singing too. No. <laughs> Look, no, I wasn't calling. You do your part. I know. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Amen. I do. So, what are we gonna do? You want me to talk about the pilgrims again? Yeah. We'll go back there. And like I reminded us before, well, I'd like us to go to Psalm uh, 33. I'm going to read verse 12 because this is, why we're, this is why we're talking about the pilgrims this week. You think it's kind of odd, but it's really not if you understand what's going on in America. It says, Psalm 33, verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. And the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Do you see that? Blessed is the nation. The nation, if you look that word up, is a group of people. He said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Have you ever wondered why America was more blessed than any nation? Have you ever wondered why, in the recent past even, how we had more money than any other nation? We had more food than any other nation. We had less disease than any other nation. Did you ever wonder why, and it wasn't because of us? It's because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. You know, he did the very thing for the Jews. And you know what happened to the Jews when they rejected God? They lost all those blessings. And you wonder what's going on now? Consider that verse. So I'm going to talk about the pilgrims, about when they first came here, because they were the first group of people that God sent to America with the gospel. They had the gospel. They did not have the Holy Ghost that we can see. They did not have the baptism and speaking in tongues that we can see. It wasn't written. But they did have the gospel. They believed that Jesus died. They believed he was buried. They believed he rose again. They believed that he guided them. They went to him in prayer often, every day, in fact. But they were a serious, sober people that wanted to worship God the way that they saw it in the Bible. And it was interesting, when they first came, I shared yesterday about the first winter. When they first came to the New World, when they landed and decided to stay in Cape Cod and in that village that was vacant, it was abandoned. Frankly, they didn't know at the time, but everybody in that village had died. They had died. There was an epidemic that hit the, the Native Americans in that area, and millions, millions of Native Americans died that were in this land. When they first landed there, there were Indians there. There was a group of, I think they were called the Wamp Wampanoag. And Massasault was their chief. They saw the pilgrims land. They were there. They were in the bushes. The pilgrims didn't see them very often, but they were there. The reason they didn't bother the pilgrims was they saw that the pilgrims brought their wives and children. And those Indians were a group of people that they made sure they did everything they could not to bring harm to the wives and children. So they figured if the pilgrims were bringing wives and children, they meant no harm to the Indians. So the Indians left them alone. And they stayed in the background. In fact, the, the pilgrims didn't see them the whole winter. Not the whole winter. But like I shared yesterday, they showed up in March of the following year. They started seeing them in the, in the outskirts 
of their, of their camps. And that's when Samosat came in and introduced himself. Welcome, welcome, Englishman. And then he brought back Squanto. Squanto was actually one of the only survivors of that village that they now lived around and in. And it was their fields that the pilgrims uh, planted the corn that the Wampanoag had for them to plant. And the pilgrims then in uh, March began with Squanto. Squanto became their interpreter. Now, April 1st, our, our, our calendar, April 1st of 1621, the Squanto and Samoset both showed up in camp and they had fish and they had skins and they wanted to trade with the pilgrims. Well, the pilgrims would trade with them because if you remember, everything that the pilgrims had then was owned by the company that sent them there. So they had to pay back the loans that the, that the company gave them so they could come to the new world. So the skins and the fish is what they would send back to England to help pay the debt that they had that they were living there. So when Squanto and Samosat came, they were trading, and Squanto told them Massasat is in the area. Amen. Now, they'd never met Massasat. They knew he was the chief, and they knew, they knew that he was the chief of the whole area. He was considered a king by the, Indian, by the Indians, by the Native Americans. And they said, he's in the area. And so things got kind of quiet. Well, an hour later, on top of the hill, Massasat showed up. He and about 60 of his warriors. Now, you've got to remember, in April, they were down to about 52 people of the, of the original calling that were there. And then they had some of the, some of the uh, crew of the ship were there too. But they had a, a less than the 60 of the Indians at the top of the hill. They didn't know exactly how to take it. Massasot wanted their governor to come see him by, by Squanto. Squanto went up and he started interpreting. The governor of the pilgrims, who was Carver, uh, yeah, Carver at the time, or Carter, said uh, he didn't want to go up there by himself. And Massasot didn't want to come down there by himself. So they sent Squanto, and Squanto started talking. Squanto came back to them and said, Massasot wants to parley. He wants to make a treaty with you. He wants to talk to you. So what they did was they asked for an, inter they asked for, uh, an ambassador from the pilgrims. Edward Winslow went. Edward Winslow went and met with Massasot. Ed, Edward met Winslow described what Massasot was like. He said he had a stern face. He said he was a man of few words. He was a king. And Massasot and he with the interpreter, um, Will, um, Edward Winslow, gave kind of a speech of who they were and why they were there. And he said, Squanto did an okay job, but not the best of interpreting what, they, what, his was, what his words were in English. But Massasat liked what he heard. And they decided, he said, I want to make a treaty with you. So what he did was he took some of Massasat and some of his warriors, laid down their bows and arrows. And Massasat walked back with Edward Winslow back to the camp. The Carter, Carter at the time was governor. You know, it's amazing. Carter was the governor this day. He died not very long after that, and then uh, Bradford took over as governor. Carter walked, uh, Carter, uh, the, what was it, um, Bradford and William Brewster met with Massasot at the bottom of the hill, and they all three walked into a hut, into a, into a house, a, a cabin that they had just built. There was a green carpet on the floor, and they put some pillows on the floor, and they all sat on the floor, and they started talking. Squanto was the interpreter, and they made a treaty. The treaty was very simple. We don't want to hurt you. You don't want to hurt us. If, if somebody comes to hurt us, we'd like you to be our allies. If somebody comes to hurt you, we'd like you to be, we, we'll be your allies. You know, Squant, um, Massasot was king, but there was another tribe of in Indians. I think it was the Narragossets or whatever. He was at war with. The, the, all the Native Americans in this land did not get along. They were constantly at war. And Massasot saw that the pilgrims could help him because, frankly, the pilgrims had armor and they had guns. And the Indians didn't have that. So they made that kind of a treaty. And they, they also said, if one of our people um, do harm to you, we're asking that you send that person back to us and we'll take care of the punishment, but they will be punished. 
They said, if there's anything stolen, please give it back to us. And then Massasad said, I would like you to, take a, to send a message to your king. And that was King James. He said, I want you to send a message to King James. I want to be your friend and I want to be your ally. And they made a treaty that day and that treaty stuck for 40 years. Frankly, it stuck beyond when Massasat died. Massasat was a young man at that time. Winslow described him as very fit. And he said that when you looked at the Indians, you could not tell that there was not a lot of difference between Massasat and the other Indians in the way they dressed. Massasat's face at the time was covered with red paint. He said they, they called him. He had oil on his head and his face. They said he looked kind of greasy. But the others had paint also on them, some red, some black, some yellow, some and that. But he said the only way you could tell that Massasat was above the other Indians was just a necklace that he wore. He said he wore a, a, a bone, a white bone necklace with, with um, white beaded bone on it. He said that was the only difference you could tell. So they traded with Massasat. They made the treaty. They, and Massasat and his warriors went off. Now, the, what was amazing is Bradford describes the next couple of months. He said, you know, he said, that trade stuck. He said they would go a couple at a time into the forest around where the Indians were, just two men hunting for, uh, hunting for quail or hunting for turkey or hunting. And he said the Indians would leave them alone. They left them alone. So they got along together. Now, the first harvest of the, Indi of, of the pilgrims came. If you remember when they landed, they had nothing to, to plant. They didn't have seeds to plant. It was amazing, but God provided them the seed for corn, and he provided them the seed for beans. He provided them the seeds that they needed, and they planted that year. And in, in September, late September, October, they had their first harvest, and it was a good one. You know, Squano's the one that showed them how to plant corn and fertilize it with fish so that it would grow better. Squano's the one that showed them the best places, the best places to fish. He showed them how to hunt the berries in the forest. They had berries they'd never seen before. He showed them how to hunt nuts. He showed them how to, where the best places to hunt were. Because of Squanto, they survived the summer. And they had plenty of food that fall. In fact, they had an abundance of, of, their, of their crops. And you know what they did? They decided we've got, to, we've got to thank God. So they had what they had. They had three days of thanksgiving. Three days where they were going to worship and praise God for what he had done. It was not in the end of November. It was in September, late September or October that they decided to get together. Well, they were so jubilant, so thankful that the ones that had survived were doing well, they were fed well, they were healthy. That they, it, at this, they, they were, what they called, they showed their arms. In other words, they got out their guns and practiced a little bit, had some, had some uh, contests. Well, they think that what happened was the Indians heard the guns and thought that maybe the pilgrims needed help. So it was told them in the middle of this feast, on the first day, they said, Massasot is in the distance. And he's got 90 warriors with him. Well, some of the pilgrims got a little nervous. They thought, could this be the end of our treaty? You know, when you got 90 warriors and then you, ha you don't have but 30 men, 30 or 40 men, things got a little quiet. They, um, they're Standish. You know, I said yesterday that Bradford didn't get sick. It was Standish. I thank you, David Casbright. said Standish was the one that didn't get sick. He was their military leader. Well, he got them all together. He said, we're going to have to get ready to see if we're going to have to have to protect ourselves. Well, here comes Massasat with 90 warriors. And when he realizes, they realize that Massasat is not there to harm them. Massasat is there to join in their celebration. And Massasat comes and they invite Massasat to eat. Well, now they got to feed 91 warriors. Well, they didn't have enough food at the table for 91 warriors. You know, it was interesting. The Indians went into the forest, and in not very long, they come out with five deer, five big deer. Now, I've got to tell you people, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania deer and Texas deer are completely different. <laughs> Texas deer are about the size of a large dog. The, the Pennsylvania deer are about the size of a small horse. They, they fed 
everyone there. They had deer, they had turkey, they had pheasant, they had the corn that they had. They had bread that they had made out of the corn. They, were, they had squash. They had an abundance of food. And for three days, three days, they thanked God. They worshiped God. They praised God. And they celebrated with Massasat and the 90 warriors. They all stayed there. And when it was finished... Massasat and his tribe went back to back to their tri back to their um, back to their camps, but that's what the first Thanksgiving was. And you know what? It was just days after that celebration, the ship showed up from England. The next group of people, the next group of people that were in the in the um, in Plymouth, and I think it was about ten years later, they had almost a thousand people. I think there. But um, they just kept coming. But it was that first group, that first group that met, and that first group that realized, you know, and it was, it, it's interesting. I'll finish with this. The next year, their crops, they ended up with a drought. And the pilgrims got together and said, we got to pray. And they said, we're going to set aside these days for fasting and prayer because we need rain. Do you know in the middle of their praying and their fasting, it started to rain. Oh. And it was enough rain that they had an abundance that year also. So I'm going to finish with that. And what do you want me to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? I'm not sure. Uh, God is just... breaking my heart. And doing a work in it that's surprising to me. But uh, it's a work of God. It's not my emotions Amen. at all. Uh, one thing I've learned about God not been the easiest thing for me to always humble myself. But I knew I had to. I knew if I wouldn't humble myself, God would break me to pieces. So, I had that kind of heart, that kind of will. But I never wanted people to know what I was thinking. I just thought, as long as they don't know what I'm thinking, I've got the advantage. I have had a very clear mind all my life. People with good minds have commented about my ability to think. I've been told have the clearest thinking mind they've ever seen. I just didn't say much. I appreciate what God told me in the 1970s. Uh, about my life that was brightening, humbling, but that was a purpose. It took me a long time to say that.
among them. I knew that there are certain things if you said, you just ignited the enemy. And I didn't want to ignite the enemy. I thought he'd probably get his own spark, you know? Right. Or hers. But God told me in the early 70s in Argyle. He didn't have anyone to do this job but me. I was just shocked. I said, if I'm all that you have for this job, you're completely out of material. I had a boldness about me that I didn't understand. I had a boldness toward God that I couldn't understand. In 1969, when God visited me on US 75, north of McKinney, Texas, not far, 40 miles north of Dallas, and started talking to me about selling 121 Veterinary Hospital. He'd already visited me, and we had a conversation. But, uh, well, I'm going to tell him. I was riding on US 75 going south near Anna, Texas. You'll call it Anna, perhaps. And I said, Lord, if You're the one been bugging me all these years. You sell my stock and an arena bigger than a football field, same width but longer, rodeo, whatever you want to do in it. You sell that, I'll do what you ask. And I went on down the road. The next day, I had a call from Denison, Texas, right on the Oklahoma line, to come attend the horse and had some problems. I was used to that driving a lot of miles to attend a horse that was sick, lame, or it was a, perhaps just inspect for injury. That when it was June, I don't know, warm day, 
I pulled up to the Dairy Queen in Anna. I don't know if it's still there. It's on Highway 5. I thought I'll stop and get me a Coke. And actually, I got a Dr. Pepper. Ah, and there stood two stock owners. I said, good morning. How are you? Where are you at? Denison. It's about from McKinney, what? 50 miles, somewhere there. And to look at ours. Immediately, the talk went to, would you sell your stock in the arena? Well, I didn't want to act outwardly what I thought inwardly. I said, well, do you want to buy it? Or maybe. <laughs> He's got one of them's a banker, the other's a vice president of a construction company in Dallas. They're not, you know, somebody playing with their shovel and sand. And Talk about poker faces. <laughs> All right, <good. laughs> Well, if you would want to buy it, uh, when would you want to buy it? I was shocked. How about the day at one o'clock? That was God. Do you know that? Amen. These you, guys. 24 hours before, you said, if you'll sell it. Right. I'll do what you ask. Yes. So I said, well, what kind of money are we talking about? And we settled that. I said, when would you like to do this? How about 1 p.m.? God. Now, I said, okay. I believe I can do that. Believe. Went to Denison, came back, stopped at the Anna Bank. So they, the, the sale didn't even happen in Dallas, it happened in Anna. Yeah, the Anna Bank. One of them was president, the other was a stockholder. And back. Am I running two stories together? No. I didn't think so. I got much pressure on my mind. No, I got I got the two stories. Yesterday's and the days. Thank you. So I came back, stopped the bank, but then we changed bodies, stock was sold transferred, and uh, what I actually did was paid some expenses that were there that had been, that were passed. We worked it all out, and I was happy. I got in the car. I'm going south.
always drove Pontiac Catalina. I love those Catalina Pontiac two barrel, not four. I'd push too hard on them. Four barrel, drank more gas. And I was going down the road thinking, oh, I don't ever care. How good it feels to be free of that place. When I bought into it, I told them, it's not a wise decision that I get involved with this. And one of them said, no, you gave me your word. And I said, and I'll keep it. Because I did. That's what took place. And bad. And I was free. Two weeks later, going down the same road. I think that road's still there. It's the old highway mm -hmm. 75. The Lord said, I want you to sell your veterinary hospital and your practice and obey me. I said, uh, wait just a minute. That's when the poker face started. <laughs> I never said I'd do that. What did I mean? Oh, it's just 11.44. I didn't have any idea God would want me to do this today. But this goes along with the Mayflower, right. Rhode Island, founders, my ancestors. God had a plan. I was a businessman. I was a successful businessman and veterinarian. One man said to me once, Doc, you're the toughest man to trade horses with I ever met. I said, well, Jim, I don't think you're any Boy Scout. We were great friends. That man happened to be Jim G. Bray. Salina. He's got a son that's a lawyer. Jim's in heaven. His son, I think, practices in Prosper. You're the one that led him to Christ, aren't you? Jim, led him to Jesus, yeah. I'll tell you what, Jim was a Baptist. He was a friend to some very well-known preachers that were football players. National League football. And back there were maybe three, certainly two, and one day, I was talking to Jim. Now, he was, he worked for Gaylord, E.P. Gaylord, Savior, Oklahoma City. And Gaylord Industries in Texas, Jim, was in Georgia. Mr. Gaylord died at 100, I think it was. And Jim, very influential man. And I was talking to Jim. 
I said, Jim, have you ever been born again? Have you ever received Jesus Christ in your heart? He gave me an answer. I said, Jim, would you like to come to my Bible study in Carrollton? You know where that was? Either 76 or 77. Amen. Right? Right. Early. He said, Doc, I want to come. Come on. He came. He knew I spoke in tongues. He said, one day, Doc, I love you. He was older than you, right? 20 about years. 20, yeah, about 20 years older than you. I tell you, he got to me. Doc, I love you. He may have been. the most respected friend I ever had. Maybe the greatest. Maybe we had great respect one for the other. But, oh, I saw some times that made me Very sick. Jim had physical problems. I talked to him many times. I talked to his wife, who I don't say more. And man. But Jim and I were just great friends. One day, I don't know how in the world he found it out. Jim said, Doc, I did not know you were related to Paul Miller. I said, what? Well, aren't you? Yes. Did you know Paul Miller was an honorary Paul Bear along with me at Mr. Gaylord's funeral? I said, no, I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> I never did. Asked Jim, how do you know I'm related to Paul Miller? Yeah, I were just that kind. We didn't always tell you everything. What time is it? It is 1151. Oh, we've had the song. I have to tell you, I was really, Humbled by God. Jim died. That is funeral. I think it helped for us. And God told me not to go. What was I going to do? Oh, my God. Huh? Amen. 
I could even send him some plows, send plows, or anything. Turn him loose. Let him go. That's how close we were. Amen. One thing I know, he's in heaven. Well, you had business deals together. You had horses together. We owned them together. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, we owned Hail to Jesus, Jesus, Hail to Jesus' mother, Patty Bowles, together. I bought half of her from Jim. And he wouldn't sell me all of her. And I wanted her balls. I got one. The next one, he said, no, <laughs> you're not going to get. We're going to hold them together. So I named him Hail to Genius. Jim said, that's a good name. That horse was an amateur champion Amen. in Kentucky. Kentucky State Fair. Oh, God bless me with great friends. You know that? Amen. I think Well, I just thank God that I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and a servant of Jehovah. I think that's enough said, don't you? Amen. I'm going to find out if there's anyone that has never been saved, born again, one with Christ. Under heaven, there's just one name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. No other, just that one. Thank God. Thank God. No other. Just Jesus and that. Where you can be saved, born again, one with Christ. Speak it after me. You've got the faith. You've got the grace in your heart to be saved. Speak it and be saved. We invite you to visit Water of Life Church at 1621 18th Street in Plano, Texas. Or for further information, call area code 972-578-8082. That's 972-578-8082. Or write Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. That's Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. This program was paid for by Water of Life Church.